A few weeks after this, his course brought him to Deer Creek in the state of Maryland. If the scenes in Virginia had stirred his memories, how must these earlier surroundings have been peopled with spiritual presences to add to the memory for defying scenes? Here he met Father Boham and Henry Waters, the places of earth, high places and low, get their meaning from the footprints of life. This was Osbury's last visit to this region, as also his last sight of these venerable men. At the Virginia Conference, Osbury was called upon to decide whether or not the bishops had the right to form the eighth R. Genesee Conference. His decision was affirmative, and the new conference to be composed of the Susquehanna, Cayuga, Upper and Lower Canada districts was scheduled to meet at Lyons State of New York, July 20th, 1810. Having officially visited the Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and New England conferences, the bishops came in due course and time to the sitting of the new conference. After seeing the business of the body conducted to its conclusion, Osbury expressed the opinion that its creation had been the most judicious act of the joint episcopacy. But the annual conferences were not unanimous, unanim, unanimously of this view. There was much criticism of both Osbury and McKendry in the different settings, in the different sittings, and they were charged with exceeding their prerogative. But the bishops relied upon an unrescinded order of the General Conference of 1796. The matter finally went to the General Conference of 1812, which declared that the Genesee Conference is a legally constituted and organized conference. Whatever the constructed rights of the Episcopacy in that early day to change the conference boundaries and establish new jurisdictions, they passed to the larger prerogative of the General Conference, which must take the initiative and give authority for each administrative acts. The long and tedious path across the Allegheny Mountains and down the far-stretching Ohio Valley to the center of the Western Conference is now a familiar one. Over this path, Bishop Osbury made his way in Asalki during September and October of 1810. In company with Bishop McKendry, Lerner, Blackman, James Gwynn, and Peter Cartwright came on November 1st to a chapel in Shelby County, Kentucky, where the conference was held. The sitting over the feeble bishop rejoiced in a reported increase of 4,000 members for the year, sold his sulky, and prepared for a winter horseback ride across the mountains into the Carolinas, Unable now to preach with the frequency and force of former years, he adopted a new method of evangelizing by the way to travelers and at the doors of cabins and farmhouses. He distributed small religious tracts in German or English as his discerning ear or eye dictated. It was thus that he became the pioneer in the circulation of religious tracts and books, a role that became an effective instrumentally in the hands of a generation or two of Methodist preachers coming later. It was during this year that Osbury read the history of American Methodism brought out by Jesse Lee. The differences between Osbury and Lee were an open secret, and the bishop, judging from an entry in his journal, was both gratified and surprised to find that the historian had dealt more considerably, uh, more considerately with him than he expected. He felt moved to correct but a single statement 
of the volume, and one which involved a matter of small moment. At the opening of the new year, cheery news came from the north to the two bishops in Charleston. The troubles in the Genesee Conference, which appear to have taken on a connectional aspect, were reported composed, and the general superintendents breathed more freely. Two noteworthy records were made by Osbury in connection with the conference round of this year. The South Carolina Conference convened at Columbia and was held in the parlors of the spacious homes of United States Senator Taylor, who, with his family, was in warm sympathy with the Methodists. The members of the conference were entertained in the, mem- in the many chambers of the hospital establishment, the Virginia Conference being appointed to meet in Raleigh, North Carolina. The state officers' hospitality put the Senate chamber and hall of representatives at the disposal of the body. The business sessions were held in the chamber while the hall was devoted to preaching services three times each day. Many converts were claimed amongst them Secretary of State Hill and several members of his family. The church was thus greatly strengthened in that center. In his progress northward, the bishop and his company were entertained at Germantown, Pennsylvania by Dr. Rush, a singer of the De- Declaration of Independence and a man of renown in its day. At the end of the visit, Osbury, who had been professionally advised by the doctor and his associate, asked what he should pay. Nothing only an interest in your prayers, was the reply, both physicians being devout Christians. As I do not like to be in debt, replied Osbury, we will pray now. And with that, he called the company to prayer on the spot. At the height of summer, and between the sittings of the New England and the Genesee Conferences, Osbury crossed St. Lawrence and made a tour of a fortnight's length through the southern Canada. He saw comparatively little of the country, but got a fair idea of conditions there. He saw difficulties, but was cheered with prospects. His patriotic American feelings were deeply stirred while crossing the line. Returning from the hardship of the adventure, he fell sick and fainting in the arms of Bishop McKendry, for whom his affection increased each day. The annual conference sessions of the summer, autumn, winter, and early spring returned delegates to the general conference to be held in New York May 1st, 1812. This was to be the first delegated session of that body and much interest centered around the elections. The absorbing issue then, before the conference, was the status of the presiding eldership. Should it remain an office or sh- uh, to be filled by the appointment of the bishops, or should the annual conferences elect the incumbents by ballot? Osbury was deeply concerned that the old rule should not be substituted, and it is certain that McKendry shared his sentiments. The issue influenced the elections to no small extent, but we shall see how a conclusion favorable to the old order was reached in the general Methodist mind even before the death of Osbury. And if we leave the spiritual life, or perhaps someone involved in an area or subject or whatever does, then you end up with the natural uh, mythologization of the whole, you know, of those aspects of life. And this, this thing where people like, I'll pray for you, and then they get down and pray right in front of you it's like okay but um 
you got to be careful if you're going to do anything like that. Don't make sure that it doesn't, you know, come off like you're just making a show of it or something. 